All right, I've already loosened these four Allen head bolts that hold the cover on, so I'm going to go ahead and lift it off. And I'm going to be careful on this side of the actuator. There's a wiring harness that connects the local display and supercapacitors to the main control card of the actuator. So I'm going to pull this off and then disconnect the wiring harness by pulling straight up on the connector. Just like this. I'm going to hold it up, and this is the location of the wiring harness. Pull it straight up and set the cover aside. This is the female part that the wiring harness connects right into. Figured I'd give you a better shot. All right, I just powered up the unit, and as you can see, it says we're in remote, and this is just the initial screen for position. Then we have this triangle with an exclamation mark. Basically, what it's stating is that it's in remote control and that there's no signal present. So what I'm going to do is what I'm going to do is change that from remote to local control just by hitting the down arrow until I see local remote. Hit the enter button. If I hit it once, it allows me to view the value that's in there, but I want to change it. So I hit enter again, and then I use the up and down arrows to change to local. I want to save it by hitting the enter button, and we're good. All right, next we want to make sure that our actions are all correct as far as opening and closing actions. So I'm just going to use the down arrow. Oh, got to get out of view. Hit the cancel button again. There we go. I'm going to use the down arrow to go through these other items. So right here, I'm gonna just check and see what the torque value is for the closed direction of travel. Hit enter to view, it's at 100%, it's perfect. Going down to torque open, hit enter. That's also at 100%. Reason we want those at 100% is because the particular valve that this actuator is on closes to a limit, not a torque value. So uh, close action is what this is. I wanna check and see what it is. And as I said, this is already set up to limit, but we could change it to force if we had a torque seated valve just by hitting the enter button again. So we're in edit mode. We hit our down arrow or up arrow to change it from limit to force. That's what FRC stands for. So we're gonna keep it on limit and we're gonna get out of view. We're gonna go and see what the open action is as well. Yep, and we have our open action on limit as well. This is a floating ball valve, so we want it to just go to a particular position and we want to use the actuator's uh, full torque output. So that's the reason we keep it, uh, the torque value 100% on both open and close actions. All right, now that we have our open and close actions figured out, we can actually set our close and open limits. So I'm going to set the close limit of this valve. I don't want to view it, I want to actually change it. So I'm going to go to edit. And now what I can do is visually put the valve in the closed position via these up and down arrows. Now the actuator will move the valve when we do this. You'll hear it. So up is to open or go counterclockwise. Down is to go close or counterclockwise. Uh, and I'll show you the valve here in just a second. I apologize for the shaky video, but we have the valve about halfway open right now. All I'm gonna do is use the down arrow until I get to a good closed position. And I can verify the position with the valve stem as well. But we already have this one pre-set up, so we know that that's a perfect close. And that's an upstream relief port because this is a cryogenic ball valve. All right, now that I have the valve in the closed position, I'm going to go ahead and save it by hitting Enter. So my close limit is saved. Now I'm going to get out of view and go to the open limit. And I can set that up. So hit Enter twice to go from view to edit. Up arrow to open the valve all the way. And once I'm there, go ahead and push the enter button to save the position. And I'll show you the position of that as well. All right, and again, sorry for the shaky video, but here we go. We'll open the valve up all the way. Once we're in a perfect position, we'll hit that enter button and save it. So again, save our valve open position. Saved. We'll get out of view. Go down. All right, command four. This is where you would supply your 4 to 20 milliamp signal here in the command input. Apply a 4 milliamp signal and then hit enter. That will allow this unit to recognize your 4 milliamp signal. And then you do the exact same thing with 20 milliamps. You apply 20 milliamps and hit enter, and the actuator will recognize your 20 milliamp signal. Dead band, just, you can adjust the dead band tighter or lower, depending on how accurate you need it to be. Um, Typically, the tighter or smaller dead bend percentage you have, the more accurate your valve positioning will be, but also the more likely that you will have 
adverse effects like valve hunting. So we try to stick right around 0.2%, but we have gone as heavy as 0.5% uh, just to alleviate unnecessary valve movement. All right, so we'll leave that there and we'll move on. So I'll just hit cancel to get out of there. Now I can move. All right, status. This is pretty cool. This will let you know if you do have any issues. You can go to status and scroll through, and it'll let you know if you've got any like over torques or motor overheating or what else. We got some better options here stall opening, loss of feedback, loss of demand. So it's a pretty good thing if you guys ever have an issue. You can just go right in here and see what fault comes up. And just to clarify, this is for uh, current or active um, faults and stuff like that. So if we want to look at fault history, that's the next one down fault history. We can go in here and see what faults have been going on and everything else. So just a good kind of a data logger tool. All right, then we can go to the, all right, now we're in the advanced menu screen. Let's go in here and see what we got. We'll hit enter CPT4. That's just so you can calibrate the four milliamp output signal from the unit right here in these terminals, get it to your desired effect. Same thing with CPT20, current position transmitter. It's 20 milliamp output. Uh, speed default is 100%. But you can change this, slow down the actuator, increase it however you'd like. So we'll get out of there. Uh, stall tooth, it's basically just how long does it take until the motor operates on a change of command signal. Defaults two seconds. Uh, command source, these are all primary option cards. Uh, come default from the factory so that it can read the analog input signal. And there's a couple different option cards that Rotor provides. And basic info and control configurations. Relays, we can change our normally open and normally closed relays here. Uh, so. Yeah, so there's all sorts of options in there. Digital input, split range if you need to do that, like a 4 to 12 milliamp signal for this one, and then a 12 milliamp to 20 milliamp signal for another one. So there's all sorts of options here. UPS, uninterrupted power supply. So loss of power action loss of power action we have this one set up to close because that's typically most common but if you wanted it to go to open you just go to edit and switch it up we'll keep this one on close oh this is stay put by the way so we'll keep this uh, yeah and you can have it go to a particular position but we'll keep this one at close and that's pretty much it for now unless you're doing some esd but we can get into that later so Right now, I'm going to get this back out to the main screen just by hitting cancel a bunch. And then I'm going to switch it from local control to remote so that it'll respond to my 4 to 20 milliamp signal. There we go. And there's a reason there that triangle with the exclamation mark is in there is because I don't currently have a 4 to 20 milliamp signal set up. So again, I'll just hit the exit button to get back to our position. I know I have a 4 to 20 milliamp signal hooked. All right, now we'll just do a quick stroke test. Show that our command milliamp input here correlates to not only our valve position, but also our feedback, our 4 to 20 milliamp output. So it's about halfway. 12 in, 12 out. It's three quarters open, 16 milliamps in and out. And then wide open. Yep, it's a good picture. All right, and then straight back down. It's good repeatability. There you go, 16 and 16. 12 and 12. Eight. And closed. Okay, now that I have this thing fully operational and the stroke is all set and calibrated, what I'm going to do is de-energize the unit and install the local control and supercapacitor head. All right, I got my wires still connected in and they're coming out through this conduit entry. It's just open right now for bench testing purposes, but got my cover installed and I put the wiring harness uh, connector installed onto the main board. So now I'm gonna power it up. Now what we're gonna do is this light will continue to flash until the supercapacitors are at full charge. All right, supercapacitors are all charged up now. It takes roughly a minute and a half to two minutes 
uh, depending on temperature and all sorts of other variables and stuff. But you'll know it's completely charged when the screen is a solid white. So here I'm just going to use the local controls. I have it in local right now. So I can use the local display and the local knob here to run the valve open or close. But all right, so that's when I'm in local. You can switch and have it just stop so it doesn't react to a local or remote control. Or I can put it to remote. Right now I've got four milliamps going to it. There's eight for 25%, 12 for 50, 16 for 75, and 20 for full open. Let's put it back down to 75%. Okay, so in the event of power loss, if I just flip the power, we can see what it does. All right, we've lost power. See our screen starts to flash white and red and goes to my pre-configured position. And for instance, this is closed. And this screen will continue to flash red and white until the power is depleted. Now we can configure it for loss of signal so that it can fail in position, fail open, fail close. Uh, it's just a number of different ways that we can configure this. So that's uh, the Rotorx CMQ in a nutshell. If for some reason none of your controls are working, they do have as a last resort the manual override. Push this button down and rotate it right or left depending on which way you need it to travel and you're good to go.